Okay, quick review. Since I had slides in here, I didn't realize. So we talked about firing order. You should memorize the four cylinder, which is one, three, two, four. But I love this slide because these are all Lycoming. So you have the four cylinder, and it's one, three, two, four. I told you it's like right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. And then you have the six cylinder, which is going to go one, four, five, which would make sense. The one, the four, the five. Then the two, the three, the six. I like that. It makes a perfect crisscross. Then you got the eight cylinder. But then you come over here to the integral drive, accessor, in, integral accessory drive, which means that, you know how you took your accessory drive off the, off, okay, this one is all in one piece. You can't take it apart. They, it's built into it. And they put the number one cylinder on the opposite side. So thank you very much for doing that. And then the <laughs> engines that rotate backwards, they change the firing order. So gotta love them for that. Continental, much easier. And I'm gonna make four cylinders and six cylinders. So one, three, two, four. And then it's one all the way up to the front to the six, then to the middle three, then two, then five, then four. So it's kind of a crissy cross pattern. Let's see, we talked about radial engines. Firing order is what? Unless it's a twin row, then it's all different. So. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the two-stroke, the Wankel, developed by Felix Wankel. Oh, I don't think I played this one. I don't even know if it works. Diesel engine. What's different about the diesel engine? No spark plug. Okay, number one, no spark plug, and number two. High compression. Okay, high compression. Number three. Direct injection, there you go. So what what causes the um, ignition process? Compression. Yeah, heat of compression. All right. Uh, we did the gnome rotary. What's that? Got the OX5 inverted. We kind of left off talking about radial engines. <clears throat> I said World War II and beyond. Um, what do we got? One radial. All right, so unlike the gnome rotary, it, this is normal. You'd mount the crank case to the airframe, and the crank shaft is going to go around. Um, of course, a single row radial has to have odd number of cylinders. If you have an odd plus an odd, that's going to equal a even. So, all right. Uh, pros, they're very sturdy. They have the lowest weight to power ratio. So I guess that's good. They're low weight, high power. Uh, good cooling. Why is it good cooling? They're all in spin. Uh, they're not still in spin. All the cells are on the face. All the cylinders are up front. They're all out there. So, um, so what's the con to this one? You know, that's not bad. Visibility, yeah, because they're they're big round things. So you got to look over them. Um, um, no, they had good good weight to power ratio. Large frontal area. Um, no, just large frontal area. Yeah, you do have the issue with where's the oil sump. It's on the airframe. So you have, well, this is technically is called the sump right here. You have an oil sump down there at the bottom. You have to have a scavenge pump, so they're going to drain down into that little sump, and then the scavenge pump is going to pick up the oil from there, spit it back to an oil tank that's remotely located, and then another line is going to go to the oil pump, and then go pump out the engine, drain back to the sump, sump, scavenge pump out. So they all come in all different flavors here. I think most of these are all Stearmans up here. That's uh, who knows who knows their airplanes. Ryan, yeah, I, built, I did a top overhaul one of these one time. So, so Ryan has a five cylinder. That's the smallest radial I've ever seen. Then you have the Continental 220, which is seven cylinders. Then Lycoming made one, which is nine cylinders. That's the 300 horse version. They put the. It's I think that's the ugliest radial because they put the exhaust on the front. The I know, but I don't like it. Um, and then the uh, Pratt & Whitney up there, so what was this one? 
220 horsepower, 300 horsepower, 450, and I don't know what the Ryan is. Um, what's interesting about these, just tidbits. I built a lot of these, these 220s. Uh, the Lycoming uses a diffuser in the back, which is kind of cool. It's a big disc that the air fuel air mixture comes in and this disc spins. It's like a centrifugal blower. Oh, you, oh, you guys haven't had this. Uh, it's a yeah, centrifugal compressor and it comes in and, and sprays the fuel air mixture out, but it doesn't compress. It's just called a diffuser. Uh, Pratt & Whitney does the same thing, but they actually speed up their uh, compressor and it, it becomes an internal supercharger. That's standard. Uh, let's see, biggest radial ever built. No, this is the biggest one that they ever used. So the biggest radial Pratt & Whitney built was the R4360. What do you think the 4360 means? Four nah. Displacement. Displacement, 4,360 cubic inch. Had 28 cylinders producing 3,500 horsepower. So you can see one, two, three, four. So it had four, what, four rows of uh, nine? Yeah, nine times four. But that is not the biggest radial ever built. Who has, anybody know what the biggest radial engine ever built was? It did not go into full production, but it was ready. Lycoming, the R7700. So that's a 4360. Oh, that was used on the Boeing B-50. Use that one. Yeah, the people ask, I'm like, I don't know. There we go. The Lycoming XR7755. It doesn't look that big to me, but it's long. Let me see. Do I have one? No. All right. I don't have a, a good one of, the, of a radial engine, but there's some points to this. No, don't get too hypnotized. Um, I wish I could just stop it, but I can't. In that um, number, I need it to stop. Stop! Wait, we can make it stop for you. I will. Hit. That's what I'm doing. He see, 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 picks he knows what I'm gonna do. All right. Looking two different pictures. I gotta get this from the same guy. Okay. Uh, all right. So right here, this is called the master rod, and the master rod is not articulated. So. Uh, but then you have all the other ones that are articulating. So the master rod is kind of attached to this. Number two, you can see there's a big counterweight down here. So you do have to have a very large counterweight that uh, kind of balances that out. So I'll mention it before, I think it's a test question somewhere along the road. But when you're working on a radial engine, it's really important that you know where the master rod is. And it'll even say it on the data plate. So where are the master rod, what cylinder is this one on? No, it's kind of hard because once you straight up, that would be one. And if we're looking at the engine or the mechanic, which way is it numbered? Three. We gotta go this way. Yeah, that way. That'd be three. Can you go? Huh? If we're the mechanic looking at it, if we're standing in front of the engine. There you go. So that'll be what? One, two, three? Three. 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 So what happens if you take a cylinder off of the master rod? It allows the master rod to rock back and forth. And what that does is this particular one right here, see it's all the way on bottom dead center. And if I took this and rocked it this way, it's going to pull this a little bit further than it ever went before. And there are rings down here to, at the skirt all the way at the bottom. And they're right next to... This, this skirt right here and they're right inside there and when you move that master rod just a little bit more that ring pops out and you just hear a little pink and if you don't think anything of it that's fine and then when you put that cylinder back on and remove the prop these rings have popped out you suck it back in and blow rings out all over the inside of the engine so it's a thing when you're working on radials you have to be super careful know where the master rod is. And if you're working on one, you're pulling all the cylinders off. Master rod cylinder comes off last and goes on first. Just a little bit of, I'll write that later. But something to know when we talk about radials. Um, I don't really remember what this one was. Oh, good. We got to learn about this first. 
guy made this engine out of wood. It's pretty cool. Animations and... and well, I don't have 10 minutes. A power stroke and then an exhaust stroke. A second revolution. We'll talk more about... Power. Intake. Power. Intake. Power. We actually have a board across the street that does it. I was trying to say... Oh. 90 degrees apart from each other. What he's got the there is the cam ring. Radials don't have cam shafts. Can't have a shaft. They're all in a row. They have a ring. And the number of lobes is just dependent upon how many they wanted to put. And then they turn it at a certain speed. So it's really bizarre. There's no formula to say, well, a nine cylinder radial has this many lobes and a seven has this many. It could be whatever they wanted to do. And then they just turn it as fast as they wanted. And there's an inside track and an outside track. So like this inside track would be for like the intake valve and the outside one is for the exhaust valve. They're, they're kind of weird. Well, I'll, I'll show that to you when we get there. I don't know if he sticks it in there. I know, what a craftsman. It's impressive. All right, moving on, lots to do. Uh, okay, that was the end of my stuff there. Uh, so we got, yeah, we had common radials. I showed you that. We got the 670, the R680, that Boeing. Okay, back to, and then horizontally opposed engines. Back where we need to live. All right, so horizontally opposed engines. I got a Continental over here. I got a light coming over here. Light Cummings are? Gray. Gray. Continentals are? Gold. Gold. Um, this particular uh, Continental is called a permold. And that's one of those things Continental just wants you to know. They talk about the permold and sand cast. Like you're supposed to know. Well, now you're going to know. This is called a permold case. How do you tell? Also called an investment cast or permold. It has an integral drive alternator. And so it's funny when you, all the cylinders are off and the alternator's off, you'll see one, two, three cylinder holes and then a fourth cylinder hole that's slightly smaller. I mean, well, why does it have a fourth cylinder that's just a little bit smaller? The other side has three, but that is an integral drive generator that's driven off the interior and oh, does it cause problems. <clears throat> it's, I can't just say that and just move on. Um, unfortunately, this alternator drive coupling, what, what happens is there's, a gear that runs off the crankshaft. So it kind of slides, it's hard to get on, so you slide it up over and, and then it mounts to the crankshaft. So you got a gear there. And then the alternator comes in this way and it's driven 90 degrees and it's inside. So number one, it's really hard to set that up and make sure that the teeth are meshed properly. So you have to use this Prussian blue stuff and get there and you have to measure it and make sure everything sets up right. But the coupling that goes on that alternator has, has really caused some problems and it shouldn't. And one of the main problems is when you install it, you also have to check for slip and there's this copper coated washer that goes on. Well, that copper coated washer is a single use washer, but you know, mechanics don't like to read directions, do they? Washer comes off and oh yeah, we're great. You know, we got, okay, I got to lay it out. I got to get a nice little napkin here and I'm going to put my copper washer right there next to it. And I'll label it copper washer and an arrow, right? Then the nut and it'll label it. And it's so pretty looking. Never read the directions. They take that copper washer, they put it back on, torque it, you know, we'll look up the torque, you know, because there's usually a picture. And then what happens is that copper washer has already been used once and it has to go exactly. And I mean, exactly the way it was before or it won't work. And you can't put it exactly. That's why they say throw it away and put a new one on. But people don't do that. <clears throat> so they don't put the new washer back on. They use the old washer. They torque it, put the pin in, and then it starts to work. And once it starts working, it gets really loose and the whole thing launches up into the engine, explodes inside of there, blocks off oil patches. It, you lose oil pressure. The engine seizes up and everybody on the airplane dies because you didn't read the directions. So it became this big problem. And that's really the problem with, yeah, there we go. We already looked at this one. One of the big problems with aviation, especially engines, is, you know, if you, how many of you guys work on car engines, right? Or, you know, you open the hood and look, you know, you open a, a hood on any modern car, and you're like, oh, crap. No, that's, I'm not going to, you know. You know, I, I was going to change it. I took my car in for service, and they're like, well, you're due for a spark plug change. I'm like, well, well, I'm kind of busy, so, you know, well, how much are you going to charge? 800 bucks. 
$800 to change spark plugs. And my car, my last car had dual spark plugs. This one is a V6, so it has once. It's six spark plugs for 800 bucks. No, thank you. I am an aircraft mechanic. I built aircraft engines for a living. I can change out six spark plugs. I go home, open the hood, and I spent about 40 minutes trying to find a spark plug. Never did find one. You know, I go online, I buy the manual. I'm like, oh, you take the engine apart. All the way, all the intake plenum, all the, I mean, there was, I mean, a stack of O-rings. It was like, holy mm -hmm. crap. Yeah. Call the dealer up. Hey, uh, that 100 bucks sounds like the best deal I've ever heard. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and then I read something about how they even had the opening had to be clocked at a certain position, and if it was off clocked, like you know, because how the spark plug looks, it has a little thing on the uh, electrode on the end thing. I know what it's called. It's called an electrode on the end, and it had to be facing a certain direction. It could melt the piston. I'm like what? Okay, so but then you look at these and go, well, how hard is that? You know, it doesn't even have variable timing on it. You know, it's and it's. Uh, direct continuous injection. There's no injection to time. It's just how hard could it be? And so people come at these engines with this attitude that how hard could it be? It looks so simple. And, and to the credit for these engines, you can screw them up pretty well and they'll run for a while until they don't. And as I love this saying, it's never really a problem until it's a problem. So I don't know. That's just one of the things I see is, is being in the industry as long as I was and working in engines is, you know, I would get these engines that either had crashed or, you know, NTSB investigation or, you know, my favorite is when I would get an engine with screwdrivers just sticking out of it. Like they'd come in with six or eight screwdrivers, you know, that they hammered into the, the, the crankcase. It's a light company, you have to do it. You know, I can't get this thing apart. I'm like, yeah, I know, because it's a doweled case and they have to be pressed apart and you have to have special tools. And, you know, it starts with that. And like, so I guess my, my point is, number one, read the directions. They're there for a reason and they'll keep you safe. I have never heard of anybody doing something stupid when they read the directions. You know, they read it and follow it and then it works out just fine. Uh, number two is be careful if somebody asks you to put their engine together. Yeah, you can do A and P. Okay, so enough of that. Um, all right, so we did the radial engine and all the stuff about the radial. And let's talk about horizontally opposed engine. Horizontally opposed engines. Well, that is the most common in aircraft, especially these days. So I'll, I'll write all this stuff. Most common. Most common in modern aircraft. <laughs> Define modern. Anything made after 1947 is modern. Uh, pros. It's a B. What are the pros? Well, they're dependable, according to my notes. And when they are assembled properly, they are in fact very dependable. When uh, when I went to A and P school, I'll make this a short story. You know, I think I told you guys the airplanes that are sitting out there, we were allowed to fly them. Those were flying airplanes, and I've, I I sold in, in them. And I'm the one sitting right outside of our lab that's kind of a maroon color. That was my airplane, and it was brand new, pretty much when it had just been painted, new interior, new everything. When I got to school, and that was my airplane. And so we would work on them in class, and then after class, we'd go fly them, and it was dirt cheap. And uh, so I got, I don't know, 10, 12 hours, and then, you know, graduated, didn't have any money, and got a job, and, and uh, worked at this company for a while, and then the new boss came in and bought the company, and, you know, do you fly? I'm like, no, I don't. He says, well, you need to. He said, if you're going to be a good aircraft mechanic, one thing I want you to understand is what it feels like to be up in the air and over some place where you can't, when he said, you know, IFR at night over the mountains, I'm not doing that. And, uh, you know, and, and know what it's like to watch those gauges and, and listen every little, you know, vibration just kind of gets you on edge, you know. And so if you're, you're not a pilot and you're not flying in an aircraft, you really can't appreciate what it is like being over. I'm, I'm looking at Michael because yeah. he's like, yep, you know, and you guys, uh, well, did, I just flew my aircraft from, um, 
from the, what is it, the, the left lower of the United States to the upper right corner of the United States and back a, a few months ago. You know, and I've, uh, I've flown mine to, well, from Wisconsin home, from here to um, Arkansas, and then from here down to L.A. up to Boston. And so, you know, it's, there's some remote places where you're like, you know, they say as a pilot, you should always be looking, you know, always have an out. Just always playing that game. The engine quit here. Where do I land? Engine quit here. Where do I land? Uh, that's, it's tiring after a while, but, you know, <laughs> but you kind of have to. There are some times, though, I spent almost four, I had a four-hour leg where it was nothing but clouds. And I'm like, I would have to go through the clouds first. But, um, yeah, so you have a different mindset when you are a pilot, I'll tell you that. So I can only tell you the story and hope that you'll kind of understand that. Let me see, where was I? Dependable. Why did it go this way? Oh, I, that's an I, sorry. If we, so if we do make that an I, now make this an I, I, that would work out better. Okay, uh, good power to weight ratio. Um, <laughs> these are not always my words. And so economical. And then I'll add this uh, relative. It's a relative term. Yeah, the engine of my airplane's dirt freaking cheap compared to a PT6 turbine. <laughs> uh, low profile means it's it's they're not tall. They're very they're short. You know, even the um, well, really the largest engines that you'd normally find. Uh, Lycoming does make a an eight cylinder. I've never even seen one. They're so rare. But for the most part, the biggest you're going to see is a, a 540 or a 550. And, uh, you know, they're only that tall. The Geo 550s with the gear reduction, they'll, they'll add some height for the gear reduction. But um, so low profile and reasonably. R-E-A-S-O-N-A-B-L. Reasonably free from vibration. My, my last, I learned in a Cessna 140, um, love that plane. And so most all of my flight time has been in very small planes. So Cessna 140 being a two place, smaller than a 150. And then I had a friend who had a Smith mini plane, which is a little open cockpit biplane for one person and, you know, Ronka Chiefs and stuff like that. And, and uh, then I had a, a Cessna 150 for a while and that's what I was flying. And then I sold that and I bought my 182 and I'd never flown, really I'd never flown a 172, which I think once. So all of my experience never had a back seat. And so I take off and this, this, I bought this 182. And I'd never flown one before. You know, the first one I ever flew was my own after I paid for it, which is kind of scary. And so I take off and I make, you know, we take off and wow, they, they put me back in the seat and I'm all smiles, I'm loving this. You know, to me, it was big horsepower and take off. And I made the first power reduction. A little poo came out because I thought I just killed it. I mean, it just got so smooth. I'm like, oh, shit, I killed it. You know, it died on me. And I'm like, no, it's just smooth. You know, this tells you how rough my well, last one was. Uh, cons. 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 The only one that, that I really have on here is the rear cylinders. Rear cylinders. Uh, tend to run, run hotter. That's not always necessarily true. Sometimes it's the middle cylinders that run hotter, which is kind of weird. All right, designations. You kind of got to speak the, lang the lingo here. Um, so we're talking about, well, this is a redundancy. I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, I even wrote redundant, how funny. Um, so we'll move on to this. There, almost all of our engines are air-cooled. I will just throw out that there are a few that are water-cooled. I can't think of any modern ones that are water-cooled unless you talk about Rotax modern, then, which I didn't even talk about because that's a whole light sport thing, but I should add that. A lot of planes are using Rotax now, a whole lot. Uh, Rotax, um, you know, snowmobile engines and stuff. And so they're becoming very popular and those are water-cooled, turbocharged. Um, high compression um, I can't stand them 
<laughs> just to me they're too flimsy and not aircrafty and number one when you start them up they just sh they shake like hell when they start and then they're just kind of if you have you flown one behind a rotax or yeah it, it, so you have you it, and if you're used to an aircraft engine these things freak you out because yeah when you start up i mean first of all they're running at super high rpm you know i'm used to red lines at 2700 max and these things warm up at 2700 and go up to what 55 6000 rpm and then when you shut them off it's just like it, you swear it's got like a, a four by four you know piece of wood ejector that just ejects it into the propeller you just hit the and they just stop and go what the hell happened you know it's like, anyway they're water cooled so we have I'm getting off subject, sorry. Okay, let's go with the, what I want to talk about here then. We need to talk about typical prefix designators. So when we're talking about these opposed engines, they have all these different types of designators. So of course we can start with the basic one, which O, it's like an O290, O470, O200. I mean, it's just all of them. That just means opposed. And that's the more modern way of doing it. Like I told you before, Lycoming used to do it like, you know, just random letters. Um, it could have an L in the front, and that means it, a left-hand rotation. When viewed from the pilot's perspective. Now this one right here is a helpful one to me because if I wanted my engine to turn left-hand, I would have to have an LO something, like an LO320, right? That means it turns left hand. And if I had an O320, it must turn right. right hand. So it's gonna turn right hand unless it has the special little L. And there's very few engines that actually do turn left hand. Almost all twins use twin right hand rotating engines. Um, the Seneca 2's uh, Piper, they have a left hand, and I don't know of any other ones. They use an LIO360. So there's L, uh, TS for turbo supercharged. Now we'll throw out this right now. Uh, we're not doing turbochargers in this class, but uh, it's Continental's way. If you're talking about a car and I said it's got a supercharger on it, what does that mean to you? Well, what does it look like? What's belt driven forced belt induction. a belt driven forced induction? It's got a blower on the top. It's gear driven, belt driven directly. Okay, in aircraft doesn't mean that. No. Most of the time, sometimes it does. So in the horizontally opposed world, it's very rare. I don't. There are no engines that came from the factory with a belt driven supercharger external supercharger there is a company that makes a bolt on um, a couple of companies but otherwise it, it doesn't exist they just called it a turbo supercharger it means it's got a turbo so we just use turbos so turbo supercharger if it's v what do you think v means nope they're all talking about opposed engines here typical of opposed engines Opposed engines. Vertical. What? I heard it. Vertical. Vertical, Vertical means the engine you're, is going to sit, well, normally it's going to sit this way, right? With the cylinders going this way, and you sit this way. The drive shaft going up. What do you think that's for? Helicopters, like the VO435. That was a very popular one. I built several of those engines. So put it in a helicopter. Uh, what we got? H. Very close. Horizontal. Well, wait a minute. Aren't they all horizontal? Except for the V. They're all horizontal, right? They call it a horizontal. Should have called it a helicopter. Helicopter engine. It means horizontal, but we should just change it to helicopter. But it literally sits vertical, and it only is used in helicopters. But you take the Robinson helicopters, they don't put them vertical. They put them horizontal, but they're helicopter specified. And they're going to have a big cooling fan and stuff on them. So it's a horizontal installed helicopter engine. 
Um, a. Nope. That was a good one, though. Aerobatic. And I'll put this one. How about AE? Oh, he got it. Aerobatic engine. Well, what the hell's the difference? Well, the aerobatic, the A designation, this was a very rare engine. It was rare with um, a sump, an oil sump, and oil sump, top and bottom. Yeah, so it would, it would they're, I never even seen one, they're so rare and so expensive. Um, only made by light combing. And so it was a funky looking engine. It had an oil sump on the bottom. I said, one of the top. So you go upside down and the engine just had now had the oil sump down here and it just flew that way. And, but then they, that it's such, it was such an anomaly that they figured out that they could actually use an inverted oil system. Uh, Curtis did it. Uh, uh, Christian, Christensen did it. Uh, Christian, Christian or Christensen? Christian, I think. Anyway, they made this inverted oil system I'll talk about later. And uh, it just, it uses some external stuff and some ball check valves and, and things. And they figured out, well, we can make an engine out of this. But it's not just an engine with this, this oil system bolted on. Uh, the crankshaft is going to be much, much beefier. I, I wouldn't say solid because they use, still use a constant speed propeller. So you need the oil to get through the front of the crankshaft. But much beefier and it had the oil, oil system on it. Um, all right. We good there? C. C. No, I don't have C. I have I. I is fuel injected. Fuel injected. Um, G. Geared it means it has a gear reduction. Like your engine, obviously, that you're working on, the propeller bolts right to the front. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. For every time the propeller goes around, well, so is the crankshaft because they're bolted together. But you could also gear, gear up an engine so that you can spin the engine faster and the prop slower. Uh, then, of course, O is opposed. Um, let's see. We'll put second part. Second part designation. And that is going to be um, cubic inch displacement to nearest 10 to nearest tenth. So we have the, I don't know, the O200, the O300s, the, um, the Continentals, you have 320s, you don't have to write this. 470s, 520, 550, 4, 540s, there are all kinds of different ones. And then we have the suffix. So, and that is always additional information. And that additional information may be how the accessory case, um, type of accessory case, type of accessory case, uh, maybe a type, the type of crankshaft. Okay. So the cubic inch displacement isn't a separate, that's underneath second part designation? Yeah. Um, or maybe type of magnetos. It could be a whole bunch of things. I could, this list could go on and on and on. And if we put it all together, you know, we could come up with something like a um, TSIO 550-A1B. And that would be an actual engine. So what kind of engine is that? Turbo supercharged. Fuel injected, opposed, 500 cubic inch, and then the A1B is, um, it's just, 
I don't. I just made that one up. It's like the designator. Like my airplane has a um, an O four seventy dash urinal. So mm -hmm. I don't. You know, it's just the U version. Um, you can get even more tricky. Um, see, TS that that would be then a Continental. Um, there's the. Uh, GTSIO, GTSIO 520. What is that? Geared, Geared turbo supercharged, ejected opposed. That would be like in your Cessna 421s, I think. Um, TSIOL 360. Left hand, turbo supercharged, fuel ejected, left hand rotating. Um, one of my more favorite engines, sort of, uh, this is very common, Lycoming, was the IO360 um, A1B6D. Yeah, it's a common one. So the I is posed, 360. So now I would never expect you to know this, but like this means that it had a, the dual mag, the dual mag. So the two mags in one, and um, I th the B6, I think that was the crankshaft designator. It tells you it had counterweights on the crankshaft. Um, the A model had to do with the uh, horsepower version, and then the, the one was something else. I don't know. See, it, you need a decoder on that one. So. All right. You got that? So if I talk about all these engines, you know. So, so Continental... So Continental used to have, they had the, uh, the A65, the C85, the E185. Those were the old, old ones where that was 65 horse, 85 horse, 185 horse. Then in the newer models, they have the O200. Um, now they have the 240, the 360, the 470. 520 and 550 models and it's kind of interesting now i'm just taking up too much time the 360 is a six cylinder and that's the four cylinder they both use the same cylinders and so it's just six of one for the other that's how they get that um, these are the big big bores that's the smallest of the big bores and the lycoming the modern engines are the 0235 the 320, the 360, and the 540. That's, so I always liked light coming a little better. They were more easy to work with. And that all, most of these parts are interchangeable. So. Then there's like the 541. It's just slightly different. You know, it's like, what would we call it? It's the same cubic inch. Yeah, it's called 541. Yeah. All right. All right, now let's get into some brain busting stuff. Number 10. Talk about compression ratio. Compression ratio. This is the compression ratio is the ratio of the volume of the cylinder at BDC to top dead center. So it is the it is the ratio ratio of the volume. of the cylinder at uh, bottom dead center versus top dead center. So in other words, I take a cylinder, I bolt it on the engine, I put it on bottom dead center, I fill the cylinder up with a liquid, and then I bring it to top dead center and I see how much I pushed out. So it was the volume all the way at the bottom, First, the volume at the top, see a little bit left, measure the difference. You spit out the water, see what's left. So hopefully that made sense. Can you change the compression ratio as a mechanic? Or as a pilot, maybe that's an easier question. Can the pilot change the ratio? How would the pilot change the ratio? Nope, so I'm, I'm a pilot, I'm flying along my plane and think, you know what? 
I think maybe I want a little bit less compression ratio. How would I do that? No, no, I don't think you can do it. Turn it off. You turn it off? <laughs> it's close, but it's still the same ratio. It's the piston going from the bottom to the top. How can I change how far the piston travels in the cylinder? Well, I got to take it all apart and start doing something, don't I? Okay, so you're not going to change that. You cannot change the compression ratio. It is there. It's set in stone. The only way you can change it would be to disassemble the entire engine and either put in a different crankshaft that had a different throw to it or change the piston height, which, believe it or not, I'll do it because if you think about it, the piston's a little bit taller, just a little bit. When it's all the way at the bottom, that doesn't make a whole lot of difference to the cylinder. But when it comes all the way to the top, it eats up every last ounce of space. And it's like, so you're down to almost zero at the top. So a little bit taller piston makes a huge difference. So you cannot change the compression ratio. Uh, let me see. So we'll do this here. So if the cylinder, if cylinder contains uh, 50 cubic inches, we'll say of air, it should be fluid of, well, I'll say fluid, of fluid at bottom dead center and 10 inches cubic inches at top dead center, the compression ratio is what? Yeah, smarty pants, 50 to 10, right? So it's 50 to 10 or five to one. If you increase, so increasing, increasing compression ratio, ratio increases power and efficiency. Increases power and efficiency. So it's a good thing, right? All right, but we have a problem. Too much of a good thing, it's like cake is good, donuts are good, but too much cake and too much donuts is not a good thing. You get, you get the diabetes. <laughs> you don't want the diabetes. All right, so why don't we just keep increasing? What, what's my trade-off? Well, donuts and, and cake, you're gonna get the diabetes. What happens in an airplane? I keep increasing the, the compression ratio. What's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, it's going to get the airplane diabetes. Know what's it going to get? <laughs> Explosion, detonation. So when you increase the compression ratio too far, the fuel cannot handle it, and the fuel you need super high, high octane. And that's why we have higher octane fuels. When you go to the fuel pump, a lot of people look at the pump like, well, let's see, you got your 91 on this side, and what's the low stuff? 89. 89, and the middle is? 91. No, 91 is the good stuff. 87. 87, yeah, it's 87, 91. That's, I go to Costco, then we have two choices. <laughs> All right, we'll go 87, 91. So, I don't know. So, you pull up to the gas pump, and it's funny, you know, you hear people, and I hope I don't, you know, make you feel stupid here, but people look at, I love my car. My, car, my baby's going to get the 91 because it's better. Is it better? No. It's not better at all. It's the same gas, just different octane. So, you know, it's got the same, if you buy it in the same place, then it's got the same detergents. It's got the same everything, just a little bit more of, of something there. And we'll talk about that next class to give it a little bit more octane rating. So if you have a car that says this car uses 87 octane, like my, my, my wife has a Nissan Rogue, and, uh, you know, I go to the pump, and if I put in the 91... I am wasting money is the exact answer because the car didn't need it. All right. Um, but you take your higher end cars and you go in and you're like, well, I know it says 91, but gas is gas, right? And I put the 87 in. What happens? What's the difference between the two cars? Compression ratio. Yeah. So, it, it, well, thankfully, it's got a knock sensor, right? Yeah, so, it'll work. so, so modern cars, modern cars, cars, 
they have a knock sensor, a little something that sits there and listens to it. And if it starts knocking, and knocking is detonation, or knocking, pinging, it's detonation. It hears that, and it'll detune the, uh, the, the spark advance and bring it way back and retard it and hopefully keep your engine from killing itself. What happens in an airplane when it starts to knock and ping? We don't know because the propeller makes too damn much noise. We never hear it. It just disintegrates the piston, and then that's how we find out. Well, oh, remember that cylinder used to be there? Um, <laughs> Yeah, knock, knock, who's there? Number three. That's, you know. <laughs> uh, so if we increase the compression ratio too much, we get that problem. You're going to see now, if you watch the news at all, you know, we talked about they're trying to get rid of the 100 octane, they're trying to go to 100 low lead, or not 100 low lead, trying to go to a, an unleaded, and they're already approving aircraft that are approved for lower grade fuels. Hey, back in the day when I got into aviation, we had all kinds of different fuels. We had... The most common was 8087 or 100 octane. 8087 was red, 100 octane is blue. And you pull up to the pump and ask you, which one do you want? So oh, my airplane, you know, I flew a little Cessna 140 and we put in the um, 8087. And, but my airplane requires 100 low lead. And so I have no choice and you know, and why, what's the difference? Well, this one has higher compression than that one. So let's see, compression ratio too high. Ratio too high causes detonation. So you can only increase that compression ratio to the point where the fuel can handle it, of the fuel. So I said detonation is, is uh, detonation or detonation is like hitting the piston is like hitting the piston with a hammer. With a hammer versus a push. And you don't want to hit it with a hammer. And it causes engine failure in seconds, not minutes, not hours. It's literally like less than a minute. There's, I've seen some photos of, of pistons completely melted through, and they said this, this is about a 15 second detonation, high detonation. So higher compression engines. Need higher octane fuels. Higher octane. Uh, typical compression ratio of aircraft engines is about seven to one. That's just kind of typical. Um, Lycoming says this. Lycoming says low compression. Their low compression engines are 6.5 to 1 to up to about 7.9 to 1. Um, high compression. Is 8 to 1 or higher. And light combing ranges from a low that I could find of 6.5 to 1 up to 10 to 1 is their highest. Mm, not yet. So when we're talking about this compression ratio, it's really important that you remember that it is in fact a ratio of two different things. The piston at bottom dead center, the volume of the cylinder at the piston bottom dead center versus the volume of the piston when it's at top dead center. So at the bottom, you have this much room, the top, you have that much room. It's the comparison between the two. Then we can get into a whole nother subject that we're not ready for yet, but that's boost pressure. All right, so when we start talking about turbocharged engines, turbo supercharged, we're talking about an aircraft 
there, there's really two ways of doing turbocharging, I should say. So way number one, we call it turbo normalizing, which is we trick the engine to think that it's always at sea level, right? So the minute you take off in, a, in, a, in any aircraft engine, let's just take a Cessna 150 that's a 100 horsepower engine, it's 100 horsepower where and when? At sea level on a standard day, which is 29.92 inches at 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 Celsius, at a certain latitude, believe it or not, which is very close to where we're at, just so happens to be, at sea level. So if I have 29.92 inches and it's a standard day and I go to take off from here, what do I have for horsepower? Less than 100 because we're already at 75 feet here. So it's already lost some. All right, and so by the time you get up to, uh, I can't remember. I know my, my aircraft engine is 230 horsepower. So if I have the, uh, at 2,400 RPM, if I pull the prop back to 22 inches and at 10,000 feet thereabouts, and I have the throttle wide open firewall, I'm at about 65% power. So, you know, at 10,000 feet, you're at 65% already. So, um, yeah, the, the 150 was even less. You get up to 10,000. I don't know, 150, I don't think it would go to, go to 10,000 feet. But, uh, so, but if you have a turbocharger and it's turbo normalized, it only boosts the engine up to make it think it's at sea level. So here, so we'll say we're at sea level. So at sea level, the turbocharger really does nothing. It's like, well, you're already at sea level. And then I go up 1,000 feet, and the turbocharger is only going to work enough to tell the engine that it's at sea level. And then I go up to 5,000, and no, you're still at sea level. And you keep going and going, and at some point, it can't keep up, and it says, okay, now you're at uh, 500 feet, right? Well, as soon as it stops being at sea level, we call that uh, the critical altitude, where it stops working. Then there's ground boosted, where you could get in, and you got to be really careful, because we're at 29.92, that turbocharger is going to go up to like 35 inches or 40 or something. So you can boost it. It's called ground boosted. So I know it's break time. I can see the clock.